Welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. <laughs> hey everyone, hey Lydia. Um, first of all, before I go any further, let me say, um, I want to give a huge shout out uh, to Crystal Phelps. She's a social media director here. Hey Amanda, hey Daphne. And today is her birthday. So a real quick shout out, hey Sam. Um, to Crystal and Lee. Good morning. We're here. Hey, Melissa. We're here with Rico on his station. Um, good morning, Steve. Steve and the birds. Good morning, Bobby. Hey, Jennifer. Um, <laughs> Hi, Rocky. I've been wanting to have this. Hey, Sylvia and Donna. I've been wanting to have this episode for quite a while. Um, good morning, Sharon because so many times people don't understand, uh, apply, hey Donald, applied behavior analysis and how it works with our, with our animals. Um, I have a new internet Wi-Fi system. Good morning, Christine and Amanda. I have a new Wi-Fi system throughout the whole 10,000 square feet of this center. So hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, um, we have uninterrupted service because we have extremely strong signal. Good morning, morning Nancy from Key West, Dan, Nicole, Bledsoe, um, Rico, that's right, and there's Rocky chiming in in the background. Yeah, Rock. So I'm going to work with a couple different animals this morning and I'm going to show you how applied behavior analysis works with animals. Um, why, how, understanding it, applying it, and um, but before we get started, good morning. My name is Laura Joseph, owner of the Animal Behavior Center. We are an international educational center teaching people through our live stream memberships and projects online throughout the world. Um, good morning, Ashley, about understanding and using applied behavior analysis and positive reinforcement with animals, including human animals um, because it works it works and I've tried many different methods of um, cheers behavior modification and um, I have chose seems like the picture is much clearer awesome okay I have chose to work with applied behavior analysis with animals through um, wanting to have the least invasive, most positive form of interaction, communication, and relationship with all animals. Good morning, Sean. Hi, Rock. With all animals from fish to giraffe, alligators, primates, um, what have you. Let me start, there's a couple different animals I wanna work with today and show you. I've got one of the mammals in here with me, and that would be Levi. Good morning, Pat. Um, might do a little work with Cello the pigeon. Uh, might do a little work with Milo. We'll see. Um, I could work with Willie, but um, I really like to focus on, when I'm working with Willie, I need to be focusing on Willie, the turkey vulture. Um, so we'll see. But, kind of quiet here this morning. Believe me, it won't last long. Hey, Deb. Hey, Holly. Squeako. What applied behavior analysis is? I get a lot of people that tell me um, the words scare them. Good morning, Adrian. The words applied behavior analysis scare them uh, because they don't understand what it is. Um, it's the si Hey, Carrie. It's the science of behavior um, using B.F. Skinner's laws of behavior. Um, it's also described as the behavior of common sense. Um, the reason I use it is because it's so effective. It's the most effective form of interaction I have had and apply with all animals. When I first started taking my master's classes in applied behavior analysis, um, I'm the type of person that 
if I read something and learn something, I need to apply it immediately. Because the more I apply it, the more it sinks in and the more I understand exactly how it works. Um, and you'll always hear me say, when you know better, you do better. So behavior, thank you for sharing this live stream, Sharon, I appreciate that. Um, when you know better, you do better. And we're a society raised on using coercive methods to get the behavior we want. It happens all around us. I watch it all, I watch it happen all the time. And coercion is um, a form of, is negative reinforcement, meaning do it or else. Uh, that's how we interact with a lot of our children, um, a lot of our animals, and the word consequence and control, I'm getting ready to do a podcast on the word control and what it means and how it's necessary in working um, with our animals. I have to have control over the environment here. Um, do I always? No. Um, hey, Leah. I, I, I have to have control. If I do not have control over the environment here with the animals, I will, hey Carol, I will manipulate the environment to get the control that I need. And that doesn't mean that I'm in a power struggle or a power play at all. We all need control over our environment on a daily basis. Our survival depends on it. Um, so what I do here and true applied behavior analysis is keep control over the environment and um, a certain aspect of the animal's behavior in order to empower the animals, enrich the animals, um, and keep the animals learning. So like I said, applied behavior analysis is, this is what it is. Using environmental events to control behavior. That's what applied behavior analysis is. What environmental events is, and those of you that are in the membership program know this because I talk about it all the time, an environmental event is anything in the environment. Me, I'm an environmental event. Levi, the deaf bulldog walking by me is an environmental event. Pine nuts. <laughs> Dog treats. Attention. Um, the lights, if the lights are on, that's an environmental event. If the lights are off, that's an environmental event. If you turn on a light, it can affect behavior. It will change behavior. If I turned on a light out here in the middle of the night, it's going to have an effect on behavior of the animals in this room. Um, somebody walking through that door, that's an environmental event. So if I'm sitting here training, touch the almighty awesome Captain America here, otherwise known as Rico, um, and I'm in close proximity with him, and everybody here knows this. Um, I always tell everybody, if you touch that doorknob, walking into this room, you are having an effect on behavior on the other side of that door. What effect is it? For example, that's an environmental event. That door opens, that's an environmental event. The sound of the door opening, that's an environmental event. That's also a cue. Um, and that sound of that door creaking can be a cue for behavior getting ready to happen here in this room. Um, so I always tell people, this place can be pretty overwhelming because there's a lot of animals and they're moving in different forms. They're running, they're climbing, they're flying. Um, And I always tell, it's, it's overwhelming because I walk out that door, I'm having an effect on behavior. Here's applied behavior analysis at work. Can you see Willie, the turkey vulture, on her perch? Okay. 
Um, this is our training slash enrichment room. And there's the mammal training table guard that I just built yesterday and several and showed in some of the projects. Willie likes to watch, well, I don't know if she likes it, but in applied behavior analysis, the way you identify this is this behavior of her sitting on that perch is maintaining and increasing. If a behavior maintains or increases, it is being reinforced. Um, what is the reinforcer behind the behavior? I'm always looking for what's the reinforcer behind the behavior, whether it's a desired behavior or undesired behavior. Because if I can identify that reinforcer, if I can identify that reinforcer, then I can find what value it's bringing to the animal and then I can manipulate the environment using environmental events to control behavior. I can manipulate the environment to um, maintain or increase desired behavior or get undesired behavior to go away. And you'll always hear me say, in order to change an undesired behavior, you need to replace it with another behavior. Um, knew it was coming. If I want the behavior of Rico staying on that perch to maintain or increase, first I need to identify what's the reinforcer behind him sitting on that perch. I don't really know right now. I'm going to try to identify it because if I, hey Candy, hey Kelly, if I want that behavior to maintain or increase, touch, um, I need to make sure reinforcement is continually delivered. And it's always the animal that determines the reinforcer, never us. And that's why I say when you start working with an animal, identify, if you can, that animal's top 10 reinforcers. That is not easy. And those are not always food. So many people think reinforcers are food. So much of the reinforcers, the positive reinforcers that we use here um, is attention, interaction, squeakle. Hi. I'm going to assume, based on what I'm seeing now, that the reason, the reinforcer behind Rico continuing to stay on that perch is proximity to me. So there, if I've actually identified a reinforcer, it was not food. It's not food. So many times when I'm working with an animal, um, proximity is a reinforcer. Proximity to me, I am trying to identify if that's the reinforcer behind Rico sitting on that perch. The view, can't really see her real quick because it's too bright out there. The view, I'm, I'm thinking that the view is the reinforcer for Willie sitting on that perch, okay? She, when there's people in this room, she's usually on that perch. Let me give you an example of um, an undesired behavior. I don't want to say a bad behavior, um, and I, you usually will not hear me say good behavior or bad behavior. You'll hear me say desired by me, desired behavior, or undesired behavior. Um, because it may not be bad behavior for the turkey vulture because it's obviously serving a purpose. There's some type of reinforcer in that for the turkey vulture. Um, I know you guys are having a lot of comments, and I'm going to try to pay attention. It's, it's, this is tough. I'm trying to read comments and keep going with what I was trying to say. Let me give you an example with uh, Willie the turkey vulture. Willie the turkey vulture is here for training. She is a um, education and ambassador for a local wildlife rehabilitation center that's here uh, temporarily for training, and. Willie has a history of 
finding, jumping on people's head and chasing their feet is very enriching. And let's see, which way do I want to go with that? When I was talking about proximity as a reinforcer, so this is a desired behavior. I like this. And I want him to like it too. And I use applied behavior analysis because we need to live and function together. There's things that he needs to do. So proximity is a reinforcer for Rico right now for sitting on that perch. I'm pretty sure I've accurately identified that. The view is a reinforcer for what's keeping Willie on her perch. Now let me give you an example of proximity can also be we unknowingly or knowingly reinforce undesired behaviors with the animals in our care because those undesired behaviors are maintaining or increasing. If they are, they are being reinforced. Um, so let me give you an example with Willie with proximity. A turkey vulture on the ground can be a very dangerous place for a person to put themselves into. Um, that proxy, and I work with Willie all the time on the ground because she is likely to charge and um, target her beak to your legs or feet or any other appendages in close proximity. Um, so when Willie is on the ground, this is Willie, this is me. When she is on the ground, I will use environmental events to reinforce desired behavior. I will increase that proximity um, because I know the closer I am to her, the higher chance or probability she's going to lunge and attack. So what I do here is identify undesired behaviors and then I start working with them. So I intentionally ask Willie to fly off the glove to the ground. I might be able to go out and do that with her today. Um, and I do that and then I will slowly um, lessen the distance between us. If I know I've got complete control over her and because I have to, my safety depends on it. Um, there's an animal here that I cannot pick up but yet I move that animal around on a daily basis. Interesting behavior happening here. Never seen this before. So Coco is an umbrella cockatoo that came to us from a zoo. Um, you see some nesting behavior, well, some remnants of some nesting behavior happening here. Um, we are trying to eliminate that. Not easy. Because the next steps cannot happen. And um, the next steps cannot happen, which can cause frustration in an animal. Um, let me give you another example of using environmental events to control behavior. And then I'll, let's start working with some animals. Um, so Karen, who is on here, who, yeah, exactly, Lee. Um, Karen, who is the manager here, um, was out here in the center. And here's the door to get into the center. There's a hallway out that door and the door to get into this room. She texts me and told me Willie, the turkey vulture, was on the ground just outside that door. Um, or no, not outside that door, but outside the door to the next room. And um, there's a couple of doors in the next room, but the, the volunteers couldn't get out that door because Willie will just sit at the door because the window goes to the ground. And so I say all these details because I'm identifying reinforcers. And I'm like, where is she at? She's like, she's on the ground, right outside the door. The volunteers can't get back in here to the animal room. So I was like, where is her perch? And they said, what is she doing? She's like, she's just laying there watching the volunteers. So I'm, I, what I'm doing is identifying reinforcers. 
what is causing, what environmental events are happening that's causing this behavior to maintain or increase. So she wasn't lunging at anybody, but she, want, she was looking, she was continually looking. So applied behavior analysis, hey puppy, is all about identifying and observing measurable behavior. Um, and seeing if that behavior is increasing, is that behavior decreasing? And then using the environmental events to continue to make that behavior increase, or do you want it to decrease and go away? Um, so I identified the reinforcer. She was looking at the volunteers. So I asked Karen, where's her perch? Her perch was nowhere near those windows. So what I did, let me just take you out there. Now, this is an environmental event getting ready to happen. I'm going to, I know that's gonna affect behavior. So what I asked Karen to do, well, what I did was I came out here. Be right back, guys. Rico, I'll be right back. So this is the door which she was sitting at, and she can clearly look into the tree. <laughs> into the training room and see all the people. So what I did is I took a perch and moved it to right there. So I used an environmental event to control behavior. I gave her, I identified the reinforcer, which is she wanted to see the volunteers. So I gave her, an, I'm coming Rico. Um, I gave her an easier spot to get what she wanted. Um, and then this caused the behavior of her sitting on that perch to be reinforced. Um, I made this much easier for her to do. And that is where she goes. So we always make sure this perch is next to these windows. All right, Willie, you wanna do some work today? So proximity is a reinforcer for undesired behavior. And the closer I get, the more likely, okay, I am an environmental event. I came out here, her environment has changed. Her behavior just changed. She just went from a laying position to a standing position. I am paying attention to body language, I am reading it. The longer I stand here, the more she's gonna move. And the more likely she's going to go to the ground. And that is going to positively punish the behavior of me standing right here and it's going to see she's moving so my proximity is a reinforcer for her moving we'll work with cello today too um, and if she jumps to the ground that is going to negatively reinforce the behavior of me and negative reinforcement is something we like to stay away from um, it's going to negatively reinforce the behavior of me standing there. Negative reinforcement is escape avoidance behavior. Um, it's reinforcement because there's two things that need to happen for something to be identified as a reinforcer. It must happen after a behavior and it must cause the future rate of behavior to maintain or increase. And it's negative because something is subtracted from the environment. Um, an easy way to think of it is escape avoidance behavior. We try to, she's moving, she's moving and she's flapping. Um, you guys wanna see me work with her? I will go work with her. Um, but I, when I work with Willie, I really, there's the awesome Rachel Saunders, um, I really need to focus on her. I've been training Willie for several years. Okay, look at this behavior. I need that, I want that behavior to maintain or increase. So reinforce it. And like I tell a lot of people, I tell a lot of people, behavior's always happening, there's some, to me, this is very undesired behavior. Why? This is Levi, our deaf dog. And because he cannot hear, 
I reinforce eye contact all the time. Now I'm paying attention. Did he like that treat? Because if he didn't, I'm probably not going to be able to keep this behavior maintaining or increasing. Or there's other ways. Adrian says, yes, please. So we'll go out and work with Willie. Um, I want eye contact. Right now, this is why I say when you're using food or treats as a reinforcer, keep them in your treat bag. Because look what his, where his eyes are. Nice. His eyes are, where the, are looking where I'm holding the treat. That's the importance of using a bridge, a marker. Um, a bridge is a sound or a signal that tells the behavior, or tells the animal, that's the behavior we're, you're looking for that's earning you this. Because sometimes, even if there's a two second delay between getting the reinforcer to the animal, that animal could be doing a completely different, exactly Adrian, a completely different behavior and you can miscommunicate to that animal what exactly is earning it the reinforcer. Now watch this. This is an example of using different reinforcers. Now, am I using an effective reinforcer? What am I using? Attention. This means yay, yay, excited. Um, and then I used, um, I rubbed the sides of his face. So be specific, because he may not like the sides of his face rubbed. People may say, attention is a reinforcer. Okay, what kind of attention? Attention on pat on the top of the head because he doesn't really like that. Attention right here. Um, so I'm going to identify if I'm using, I don't know if I'm using an effective reinforcer right now. I don't know if my, the attention I'm using. So he's looking at my hands so I know what he wants. That's right, Rocky. So I'm reinforcing. So if the behavior of Rocky continuing to make, exactly, be specific, Bob. Peekaboo! So is the behavior of Rocky talking, maintaining, or increasing? Yeah, it is. Peekaboo! Rocky's the one in the back right there. Peekaboo! Rocky used to be a screamer. Do you want that behavior to change? Replace it with another behavior. So we replaced it with peekaboo, tickle, tickle, Rocky, whatever. A lot of verbal interaction. Okay, so let's get back to Levi. Yeah, so the importance of the bridge, watch this, eye contact. His, his bridge is a thumbs up. There's four main factors to check if you're using a, an effective reinforcer. One I'm using, I'm using several right now. And I'm training two animals right now, Rocky and Levi. I am working with immediacy here. That's the importance of the bridge. Because look how many seconds it's taking me for to get the treat to him. He could be doing something completely different by the time I give that treat to him. And I'm, using, and I'm using an intermittent schedule reinforcement with Rocky in the background, which means I'm delivering the reinforcer once in a while. So you see all these seconds going by? before I can get the treat to him. So a lot of times, what are you talking about? 
about Chucklehead? Peekaboo! Peekaboo! Ooh, ooh. So that behavior of Rocky um, continuing to give those cute sounds in the background. What's the reinforcer? Um, this is using environmental events. I had somebody tell me in one of my past live streams, peekaboo, that I need to focus more. I've got a bulldog following me around. Um, and not interrupt what I'm talking about so much. Um, peekaboo! But I, and I told them, number one, it's very hard to focus on all these, be all these animals um, and try to pay attention to what people are saying. Nice job. So I'm still getting eye contact here. Um, because it's hard for me to, I am focusing on the animals. Because I'm an environmental event. Even though I'm doing a live stream right here, desired or undesired behavior is happening all around me. Do I wanna keep that going? So when, that's why I'm always watching, and usually through my viewfinder, when I'm doing these live streams, I'm watching behavior happening behind me because we are the Animal Behavior Center, which also stands for ABC, Antecedent Behavior Consequence. And I told that person, I am always focusing on behavior. The behavior of the animals here is top priority to me. And I tell people when they volunteer here as well, um, This place can be overwhelming. Our volunteers do a great job at keeping the place spotless, clean, um, but behavior is number one. The majority of the animals here have lost their homes for one reason or another. We are not a shelter, we are not a rescue, uh, but most of the animals here have lost their homes for one reason or another and most of it, most of the reasons is undesired behavior has been unknowingly reinforced. I want to go back and look and see what a couple of you guys have been saying. I think it's fascinating watching you train the animals while live streaming. Very educational because it's happening right in front of your eyes. Yeah, thank you. Um, and that's what our memberships and our projects are all about. Our memberships and projects, this is what we do, but on a more intense level. We, we pick topics and I start I tick, pick behaviors and I start behavior issues. I start working on them. I start changing them. I identify, bam, there's a reinforcer. Bam, there's an aversive. Be careful what you do next. And I show it because you're either gonna get desired or undesired behavior. When I, this is why I love the live streams because it's raw um, training happening right in front of your face. And a lot of times I'm like, boom, I just made a mistake. And somebody, sometimes people will say, I didn't even see it. So I break it down and I'll show them and I'll ask them to go rewatch it or I'll try not to make that mistake again when the mistake may happen somewhere else. Um, and then they understand. Um, candy, an uh, A is antecedent, antecedent. I'll, I'll break that down here in a second. But that's the beauty of the live streams, is people see me train, the small steps, how I do it, the mistakes I make, how I change the environment, how I manipulate the environment to make sure that mistake does not happen again. Um, makes sense? So, ABC, antecedent behavior consequence. That is a part of every functional analysis. Never mind what that means, but, when I'm working with behavior, I just like to keep an eye on him. When I'm working with behavior, if I want to change behavior, if I'm, um, somebody remind me to talk about training and applied behavior analysis. When I'm working with a behavior, the way I was taught in my master's classes is start with the behavior. Always identify, pinpoint, be specific, be, be specific, what's the behavior? Um, and so many times people clump too many behaviors together, which is easy to do. Break it 
down, really specific. Um, for example, let's just say, because this is what I'm working on right now in the Parrot Project. Let's just say Coco attacked me. Coco is the umbrella cockatoo from the zoo. Let's just say, say somebody came in and said Coco attacked me. I'm going to say, be specific. Tell me, and that's what applied behavior analysis is, breaking it down. Because when you break it down, then you identify what happens right before the behavior, which is the antecedent, what happens right after the behavior, which is the consequence. And those consequences are reinforcers. There's your reason why the behavior is continuing to happen. If you can identify what the antecedent looks like, if you want to change that behavior, um, or have that behavior or reinforce it, positively reinforce it, and wanting it to maintain or increase, identify the antecedent. What happens immediately before the behavior, okay? So, back to Coco attacked me. I am going to say, what specifically did Coco do? Um, and this is the problem with labels, because labels are things such as aggressive, hormonal, um, psychotic, We try not to use labels here. If I use one, I use it to get a, a, a quick message across to the audience. Um, if I need an, a person to stop, I'll say, and I can't think of something fast enough to get that person to stop, I'll say, that animal's aggressive. And why do I continue to use those labels? What's the reinforcer? Because it's the immediacy. I get the behavior I want um, immediately because, and I have to, to keep control of that environment because either that animal or that person is gonna get hurt. The prop stubborn, yeah, Lydia. Lydia is a dog trainer down in uh, Cincinnati, uh, who I've yet to meet, but I'm sure we will. Um, stubborn is a big one. So many times I hear bulldogs are stubborn. And I'm like, Psst. Take that label and throw it out the window because it's not doing anything for you and it's definitely not doing anything for that animal. I have a bulldog. I'm not exactly sure what stubborn is, but I get behavior that I want from Levi. I would not consider him a stubborn dog. Um, he's a quick learner. He's very observant um, and he's, he's the dog he is the dog that I take everywhere with me when I need to do an educational program because he doesn't listen to me because he can't hear me, but he pays attention to me and we communicate through training. I get a lot of people in applied behavior analysis or people who are board certified behavior analysts that contact me and say, I'd like to get more involved in animals but I don't necessarily want to train. I just want to work with behavior. Um, and I, that just throws me off because training is communication. Training is teaching. Touch. Training is teaching. Training is communicating with that animal. What are you, what are you communicating? And when you teach other behaviors, you can replace it with a desired behavior for you and the animal where you're both getting what you want. So training is teaching. Teaching is learning. Animals are learning through what you're doing, through environmental events. Um, and that is a, having a major effect on behavior. So training and behavior are like this. Um, and here we focus on training, behavior, behavior modification, and enrichment. All three of them need to come together because why we are so focused on enrichment for numerous reasons numerous we have a huge uh, we have a large and very dedicated it's not large um, we have a very dedicated enrichment team here volunteer team um, good Nancy because it gives the animal something to do 
It gives the animal mental stimulation. Um, and when you have mental stimulation, you can redirect behavior. You can replace undesired behavior with desired behavior. And that is why we're so huge on enrichment because it gives the animal something to do when you're not communicating with it and building that very strong relationship through using positive reinforcers and manipulating environmental events to get the behaviors you want. Because studies show that if you're actually using positive reinforcement training, it is the animal's preferred form of enrichment. And that I agree with 100% because I see it on a daily basis. And, um, but we can't be training all the time. So that's why we focus on so many of these enrichment toys that we would provide for all the animals because that can redirect behavior and replace undesired behavior while we're not out there actively training and showing what to do. Willie just flew up into the rafters, so let's get some food cut up for her. Um, and let me take you out there. We created a station for her. Okay, here's another example. Um, Willie's cage is 10,000 square feet. And Willie has a history of not letting people into her cage. <laughs> so we have people here daily coming and going and coming and going. She identifies cars. She knows when a new car, I know this because if she sees a new car in the parking lot, she does not come out of the rafters. And she will not come out of the rafters because the reinforcer is the view in identifying who is this new person that does not belong near my cage. And yes, that's me anthropomorphizing. So, what we do instead is I told Karen, the manager here, I said, we have new volunteers coming in. The undesired behavior is her uh, flying to the front door and not letting anybody in. So let's pick something else for her to do uh, and let's create a station. So I'm gonna show you her station. And we actively trained um, through using size, immediacy, contingency, um, the four main factors in identifying reinforcer effectiveness. I'm not gonna go into the fourth one without giving a live stream on what it is. Um, so we shaped that behavior of her staying on a station and going to a station when volunteers come in the front of the center. Of the center. So we identified the undesired behavior, we identified the reinforcer, we gave an alternate behavior, stay on your station for higher valued reinforcers. And I won't go into details what those are. I need to run back here and grab a um, paper towel. Right, Coco? If we can, if we have time, I'll work with the pig as well. Um, pigs, a lot of people have problems with pigs. Um, pigs are very, uh, they can be very social animals. They're very manipulative. Oh, Willie's flying around, she's so beautiful. I love working with exotics. I do train domestics. We've got a couple of dogs coming in this week um, that I'll be doing live streams on. Um, <laughs> Nancy, I'm just reading, <laughs> reading your comment. Um, somebody asked me the other day, why do you love working with exotics? Um, I love working with exotics because they're not domestic animals. They can be very dangerous and it helps me keep my, my skills in tune. And um, if I start working with an animal that I'm not sure if it's going to lunge at me, um, I always make sure it's protective contact, protective contact training, which if, if Pat's still in here, her and I, Dr. Patricia Anderson, her and I gave a presentation on protective contact training last year together. 
Um, I will always make sure there's cage bars between me, between us, until I can act accurately, identify behavior, identify antecedents to desired behavior, undesired behavior, and identify those consequences and make sure that I am working with highly effective reinforcers. That pigtailed macaque, the primate that I used to work with, when I first started working with him, I was like, I do not want to work with this animal. I have never been afraid of an animal like I was of that animal. So, I'm trying to identify a reinforcer behind that. I started working with him. I worked with him for a year. Let me just get some food. I'll be back. Coco was a big screamer when he came here. And even though I'm over here cutting up food, even though I'm over here cutting up food, I'm still training. I'm training and I was reinforcing desired behavior with Coco. Um, but back to Micaiah, I mean, sorry, I didn't mean to give the name of the animal. Um, back to the primate, I trained him for over a year. I came across his photo yesterday and it brought a tear to my eye because I'm like, wow, did we develop an awesome relationship. And it was so strong that our relationship became so strong that he began uh, resource guarding when I was in close proximity. So, I think and built a strong relationship with that macaque. Um, you miss Zoo Days, Nicole? Hang 10. I've got some coming up for you. So those of you that are in the memberships see the zoo training. Um, you'll be happy to know I've got some zoo training lined up. So I'm trying to replace undesired behavior. So my tone of voice is a reinforcer. So I'm always listening, always watching what's going on. Sharon, if you're still in here. And Rico is back on that perch. Sharon asked me, are you ever not training? And I'm like, no, because the animals aren't ever not learning. So I'm going to feed Willie first so I can then work with Cello. And I'm using environmental events to manipulate behavior. I know if I go out there and try to, try to train Cello first, Willie's going to fly to the ground. I know if I, if I, it doesn't matter that I'm working with birds in these instances. Because this applies to every animal. I know if I work with Cholo first, Willie's going to fly to the ground. If I work with Willie first and get her full, she's more likely to roost in the rafters so I can then work with Cholo and not have um, proximity be a concern. Let's take Levi too. Now let's leave him in. I'll be right back, guys. So environmental event happening. My voice. The sight of me. Um, my bearded dragon is confused by all the bird noises. We so want to get a bearded dragon here. There she is in the rafters. Okay, there's her station. I 
I don't know if she's even hungry. We'll see. So I enjoy working with Willie, and I like using applied behavior analysis with Willie because you cannot force her to do anything. Well, you can. There's going to be some consequences, and they're probably not going to be ones you like. Can you come down here? Comes. You want to come down? So Willie only gets fed on the glove. So this is, te there she goes. This is teaching her contingency, meaning if this, then this. She knows she only gets fed on the glove. Let's do some groundwork. So this is where I said they're most dangerous. Here she is. I'm going to put her on her station real quick and then I'll turn the camera around. So she's on her station. This is where we started feeding her and reinforcing the behavior of her staying there while people walked in. So I don't know, I don't know exactly what behavior I'm going to get right now because I don't know if I'm using, working with a very effective reinforcer. So I would target, one of the first things I did was target train her. Beak. Good. Good. Because that tells her where I want her beak to go. So we target drain dogs. We target train every animal. It's the first thing we do. Because if she's on my hand, on my glove, okay, she's looking, she thought a truck pulled in the driveway. So I looked at what she looks at because I want to know what's reinforcing her. So um, she's not acting too food motivated this morning. She is, okay, so she is not paying attention to me. She's staring off in the distance. So I look to see what she's looking at because I want to know what's reinforcing her stare. And it's, it, we have a business right beside us and it, I guarantee you, she thought the truck was coming in our parking lot. Um, and that's okay. I wasn't planning on working with her this morning, but this is how I feed her her breakfast. This is how I feed her her dinner. This is how I feed her all her meals on the glove. Um, I want to work with Milo, the mini pig, real quick before we end. So... The reason applied behavior analysis. Good morning, Milo. So Milo just walked out the door and I don't necessarily want him out there. I want him in here. Okay, so he's out there. How am I gonna get him back in here? Um, training. So this is what, what the importance of getting a great recall. Watch this. In the pig project, uh, we were just talking about how to get a rock solid recall with your pig. 
I need, he's peeing, so I'm not going to interrupt him. Here comes Cello. This is why I say, be your animal's deliverer of awesomeness. Take their awesomeness and stick it in your pocket and deliver it when you ask. I want to show you a new behavior I'm working on with him. <clears throat> Come here. Um, <clears throat> be your animal's deliverer of awesomeness. Do you, so do you see that when I walk into a room, I like animals... <sighs> I know I've been a very effective communicator and teacher if those animals run to me um, and, and, and will work for me for attention. So I need Cello off of me because we're training him in level one membership to come into a new room. I was going to show you a rock solid recall with Milo, but he's a, he had to pee and he came running back to me when he was done peeing. So let's bring him in here. I know we're coming up on our time. Watch this. Milo! <laughs> Get a rock solid recall, huh? <laughs> Can we speed that part up a little bit? Um, create an S delta. Um, remember me saying one of the first things I'll do is target train an animal. Why? Did you guys see the video I posted this morning of the giraffe that I was working with teaching him to target his nose to a stick? I target. A target means teaching an animal to touch a particular body part to an object. I'm reinforcing him sitting, standing right underneath me with just petting him. So I don't always use food. Did you see? If not, it's, it's um, I just posted that video last night, teaching an animal to touch its nose to an object, or it's a body part to an object. Um, we do rear end targets for rectal temperature taking. We do foot and hoof targets for nail and hoof trimming. Um, I do this for vet prep procedures, okay, a head target. I did this with the giraffe as well. Hold, good. Because if I can get him, hold, good. I haven't done this in quite a while. Hold, good. And I want his body to remain still, and I'll show you why. Hold, good, because if he knows this, hold, then the veterinarian can come in behind him and do what he needs to do, good, while I sit here and reinforce a head target, because it's teaching the animal what to do, not telling him what not to do, hold, Good. Hold. Good. So if I wanted to train an ear inspection, what about an eye inspection? Hold. Good. So we have, that's a head target. I want you, a particular body part to an object. I want your forehead, hold, good, targeting to my hand. Um, nice job, Milo. And um, we're getting ready to train rectal temperature taking and hoof trimming in the pig project. Now watch this. People think target sticks are magic wands. When I used to give classes here, which I'm contemplating doing classes again. I've been approached by it. Um, not sure if I'm gonna do it or not because I, I will if I can live stream it in the memberships and the projects. People think this is a magic wand because this is one of the first things I will have everybody train their dogs, their cats, yes, their cats, their birds, uh, their pigs. It's one of the first things I train in any zoo 
because it gets an animal to move from point A to point B. People think this is a magic wand because when this comes out, animals come alive and they're like, oh, there's a target stick, I gotta touch it. That is a result of contingency. So Sandy's here. Okay, so Milo knows to touch his nose to a target stick. Touch, good. This gets an animal to move to point A to point B. So because I don't have a crate in here, we are working on crate training with Milo and Snow because Milo, the pig, will attack Snow. Let's just say that bed is his crate. Watch this. Milo, touch. Good. So that's a way for me to get him in his crate. Touch. Good. Targets get animals moving from point A to point B. Good job. There you go. So I don't give an end of training signal because it can frustrate the animal. And like I said, if you're actually using positive reinforcement training, it's the animal's favorite form of enrichment. If I'm working with the macaque and he's enjoying that training session, why wouldn't he? Because positive reinforcers are be being delivered all over the place. Um, if I give him, okay, we're done, I am going to get this and <laughs> back and forth on the, in the cage. So what I do, I don't want this, so I redirect behavior. And that's what you saw me doing right there at the end. That could be an end of training signal. Uh, but what I'm doing is I'm redirecting behavior. I threw treats on the floor so he doesn't get frustrated by sitting there still watching me, waiting for me for him to start training him again. Um, hopefully I've made understanding applied behavior analysis uh, more effective. Uh, in understanding through working verbally with Rocky, the Moluccan cockatoo, Levi, the deaf dog, Milo, the mini pig, Willie, the turkey vulture. Um, the reason I do what I do, I am teaching and communicating through my training. Training affects behavior. You guys hear me say all the time, if that animal can see, hear, smell, feel, you, you are training that animal, whether you realize it or not. You are communicating with that animal. The key question, what, is, what are you communicating? Um, the reason I do this is because I love empowering animals, giving them choice and control in their own environments where they may not have as many choices. Um, and I want to empower them and enrich their lives and create such mental and physical stimulation. And the best way I know how to do that is through teaching, through training. Um, and that is why I do what I do. Thank you. I am glad you guys really enjoyed this live stream. Thank you guys for the shares. If you wanna find out more information about us, you can go to theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, and if you like these live streams, take a look at our membership program and our projects, because this is what we do numerous times throughout the week. And I have an afternoon full of live streams. I live streamed all day yesterday, and I won't be done until about 2.30 today, starting immediately after this one. So anyways, yes, thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Um, been truly, utterly fascinating. Great, I'm glad you guys enjoyed it. And I get so many comments from you guys during the live streams, after the live streams saying how effective um, and how it's changing the relationship you have with the animals in your care. And that is the reinforcer behind why I continue to do these live streams. So thank you. Also, you can join and sign up for our email newsletter list. You'll be notified of any new blog posts, any new videos. Um, thank, once again, happy birthday to Crystal Phelps. She's the one that takes care of our Instagram account. Um, nobody does my Facebook account but me because I because they can't, um, and I share a lot of videos. So thank you guys, have an awesome weekend, and pay attention to our October event coming up. I'll see you guys. See you next Sunday, hopefully. I think it's Father's Day. Peace out, see ya.